All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna get started. I'm Carolyn Jacobs. I'm with the Education Department at WGBH. And on behalf of everyone at WGBH, I wanna welcome you. And also on behalf of our facilitators and panelists. And we also have a couple of um, people from the Education Department, April and Angelica, who will be taking care of your questions and organizing them in the Q&A box. So um, we started uh, peer exchanges uh, several weeks ago. It was actually the beginning of May, I believe. This is the sixth in uh, what we hope will be an ongoing um, project and series. This, we've uh, done a couple on distance learning. We've done a few on anti-racist uh, classrooms. And uh, we also did one last week for um, tech high schools in Massachusetts. Coming up, there will be one on August 11th, which will be a conversation with an author, Dr. Goldie Mohammed, who wrote a book called Cultivating Genius, Culturally and Historically um, Responsive Teaching, a Framework for Literacy. And you'll be getting information about that. So I hope you're able to join us. And in the survey that I've mentioned, uh, we'd love you to complete. Our research department um, takes all your data and helps us to do better the next time. And uh, everything, uh, everything is anonymous, of course. But in the survey, you'll have an opportunity to uh, make other suggestions for topics um, and give us feedback about um, what you experienced tonight. So we started these um, peer exchanges with the idea of having an authentic space for educators to speak to one another, to learn from other, one another, and to make connections around uh, current topics. And um, so that's, that's kind of our mission. And we're going to continue to do more of that um, as we move forward. So um, just a couple of housekeeping in the chat. The chat uh, is, if you post something in the chat, it will only be seen by panelists. We encourage you instead to put comments and questions in the Q&A box. There are two people, April and Angelica, who are watching that Q&A box. Um, Angelica will respond right away on logistical type things and April will kind of synthesize questions and then feed them to um, the panelists as we go through the program. I wanna introduce um, Takara Nagayoshi and Tasha Jones who are the facilitators. Um, Takaru is the 2020 Massachusetts Educator of the Year and a high school AP English teacher in New Bedford. And Tasha, um, a Teach Plus Commonwealth Policy Fellow and poet and middle school English teacher in Springfield. And they will uh, give further introductions to themselves and then um, move us through to the panelists. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Takeru Nagayoshi, and I also go by TK. And I am happy to be here today and talk a little bit uh, or a lot of it with all of you on what it means to do anti-bias, anti-racist work uh, today. Tasha, can I send it over to you? Muted. <laughs> Thank you, TK. Thank you, Carolyn. I am Tasha Jones. I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm grateful to be in this space um, right here in this area. And I know people are calling and coming in from all over the country. And so I'm glad to be a part of this space um, especially talking about um, anti-racist work. And so I thank you for um, hosting and I'm looking forward to learning from everyone as well as uh, growing what our, our needs are to, to be better. Uh, so before we head right into it, we just wanted to say that we had over 400 registrants in the first hour alone. We had over a thousand in total. And I think it just reflects the sense of urgency and the desire for a lot of educators in the state of Massachusetts to act. Uh, as Carolyn has mentioned, this is a session that's a follow-up to a lot of the racism and implicit bias peer exchanges that we've had uh, in the past couple of weeks, and we are very excited to continue on this conversation, but through the specific lens of what it means to be a white educator in America today, and what it looks like in relation to the work that we do with our school community and our students. 
Uh, so I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves in a bit. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to give a quick rundown of today's session and what it's going to look like. Uh, so the first thing that we'll do after this is just introduce our wonderful panelists who are going to tell us uh, a little bit about themselves, where they teach, right, and why they came into this work. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do a quick activity share. Uh, where each of the panelists from their own context and the work that they do are going to give us some resources, some tools, some strategies uh, in terms of anti-racist work uh, that they've done or that they're planning to do in the classroom. Uh, then from there, we're going to be having a panel discussion uh, and ask a couple questions for them to unpack what it means to be a white educator today. Uh, we're also going to net some time, um, maybe about 10 minutes or so after today, uh, for those of you who want to continue on and stay with our discussion. Uh, and as Carolyn has mentioned, please uh, feel free to use the chat function, to use the Q&A function, uh, to ask some questions, to send some shout out and love to each of our panelists as we have this wonderful conversation today. Right. Uh, so without, if that's okay, um, further ado, uh, Tasha, did you have anything else to add before you go on? I did. I wanted to add to everyone who is uh, who is listening and watching, watching that we have created this space as a safe space for those of us who know and can share opportunities with other people, and those of us who are in the process of learning what this what this means and how to do it. And so I want you to be very cognizant that in this space we are feeling safe to to speak our truth. And we are feeling, feeling safe to share with you what it is that has worked for us and that we are asking you to do the same. You know, we are asking you to also feel um, safe in this space because it is protected and we want it to be protected. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tasha. All right, so let's get our panelists to introduce themselves. Carrie, we're going to start off with you. Uh, tell us about yourself, how you identify, what, where do you teach, uh, and what really brings you here, right, uh, especially as a white person. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, my name is Carrie Zagarella, and my pronoun is she and her, and I work in the Ipswich Public School System, and I teach kindergarten. I've been a lifelong early childhood educator. It's my career and my love. Um, what especially brings me here today, I guess, is um, the difficulty and the urgency. Um, you know, um, we have not been taught how to speak about race. In fact, we've been taught not to speak mm. about race. So I hope um, with these exchanges with fellow educators, um, I hope to listen and learn um, and engage in um, conversations. Very good. Uh, let's move on next to Christian. Hi, good evening. I'm Christian Scott. I was uh, born and raised in Daytona Beach, Florida, and I'm now a uh, resident of Boston and I teach middle school social studies in the Boston public schools. Um, what brought me here was reflecting on my own experiences as a person coming from the south moving to the north but mm -hmm. also my experiences as an educator in a predominantly um, I guess you would say minority majority or predominantly persons of color school system but particularly the school that I teach in in West Roxbury is majority white up until sixth grade and then majority persons of color for seventh and eighth grade where I do most of my work. So it's kind of an intersection that I find myself at a lot. And I wanted to kind of grow by talking about what I do, but also just by, you know, putting it out there and hearing from other people. Thanks so much. Uh, and not last not, but not least, Dan Adler. Thanks, TK. Uh, so my name is Dan Adler. My pronouns are he and his. I teach sixth grade science in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, and I'm here just because watching George Floyd's murder captured on video, watching the effects of state violence on black people in this country, in combination with the murders of Breonna Taylor in her own home and Ahmaud Arbery for the crime of Sorry, I muted myself by mistake. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Um, this for me was just a realization that we need to do more and I need to do more. And then even saying that, I, I want to just recognize that my breaking point was just one more piece of evidence of my privilege, especially mm. as a white man, right? In the past, I think my privilege has just allowed me to say, this is horrible, but then within a few weeks, we're, we're sort of back to life as normal. And that's a luxury that people of color don't have. They can't return to life as normal so often because of all of the ill effects of systemic racism in this country. Uh, I'm here because I believe it's immoral to do nothing, to be a passive participant in this system that prioritizes the lives of some over others. 
And while I've been reading and learning as much as I can, I also just want to name that internal work is insufficient. Uh, change requires action, and I'm hoping that by sharing with you and listening to you tonight, uh, we can find ways to make a meaningful change. Very good, Dan. Thank you for that. I think that leads us right to where we're going next in regards to action. You know, what have you all done in regards to pedagogy to make sure that um, you are representing anti-racist work? And so I, I really want to build on what it is that you're talking about now. And then if you could share with us individually in the same order with Carrie, Christian, and Dan as it relates to what are you doing uh, from the curriculum standpoint or pedagogy standpoint? Uh, what activities are you doing um, to, to make sure that you um, dive into or delve into this anti-racist work? Sure. If uh, I can interject, Carrie, real quickly before we do. Um, if we can just have our panelists write and rename themselves so that we know what your context is for grade uh, and then also what content you also teach. Uh, likewise, I'm noticing a lot of awesome questions coming in, a lot of chats happening on the conversation. Uh, please feel free, audience members, to use the chat function to have a meta conversation. Uh, and so as panelists, as facilitators, we might not be able to uh, go through all of the questions and conversation points that are happening simultaneously with over 700 people. Uh, and so feel free to use the chat here and there uh, to continue on this discussion. Um, Thank so you. For that. Uh, and then Carrie, back to you. Okay, hey, um, so um, some of, a uh, couple years ago, um, some colleagues um, from my school, the Winthrop School, shout out, Ipswich, um, formed a, a social justice group to look at equity and to look at these issues. And it was really after sort of the slam against immigration um, mm -hmm. and, and immigrants, the you know backbone of our country and the Statue of Liberty's torch. So we um, formed this group and we weren't quite sure uh, what we were gonna do except talk and read. And what we did was we developed some lessons to share with our colleagues. And so um, what we're um, focusing on is classroom libraries right now to audit our classroom libraries and to, to uh, purchase um, books that are relevant. Um, I shared, um, our, our group um, looked at grade level books and assigned each grade level with a book so that we could build on this work just as a beginning and we developed lessons for that. So in kindergarten, we did The Day You Begin by Jacqueline Woodson and it's a phenomenal book that also has a whole teacher resource online from the author and the book um, details a, a young girl who comes new to a school and feels different and looks different and um, her adjustment is not I'm going to be like them her adjustment is that she finds courage to be herself and mm -hmm. um, so the activity that we um, have done with that and the focus for a lot of the books um, to begin with um, are on identity and so that's where we began and with the um, on the day you begin the kids did identity maps and shared them with each other um, and then during the activity I reframed it that they shared um, with a partner but had to report out about the partners identity and so the you know just requires some listening to um, but um, so we do ha have developed um, many lessons but another thing that is just the foundation is how you treat children and how you make a classroom community. So I think focusing on the systems in your classroom that allow for independence and allow for choice and allow for mutual respect, group work, small group work, you can stand, you can sit, you can lay down, you can do the work you need to do. Um, all of that makes a foundation of respect that then you can start to do more work um, with the kids. So I think definitely literature we've been using and thinking about um, responsive classroom, restorative justice and classroom systems that um, highlight um, the unique individual and their identity and not, you know, put it in the big soup as we right. to say, you know. So. Right. Thank you, Carrie. I want to, uh, before we go into Christian, I do want to say that uh, there are resources that we're going to attach and make available. So for every grade level, the resources are going to be available. But Carrie, can you answer in their framework, do most kindergartners come in with this social construct of race? Well, you know, um, they, um, when, I, I'm not sure really mm -hmm. honestly and and our um the community that i work in um doesn't have a lot of diversity but it okay. has some which puts pressure 
on the the kids of color you know to like sort of represent and so it's like this double-edged sword you want to make sure that you're not having this you know well look at his skin color look at right. her like right. um so but so to look at the uniqueness and identity while we're like talking about differences and while we're talking about um you know what is unique to your family and what is and different family systems um when we have talked about race before, and I, I think this is probably going to be something that I revisit, is that, um, you know, the sort of systemic racism is always in the past. Mm. You know, it's always like, well, it used to be really unfair. And, and, and um, you know, that lie is over. Like, I'm done with that. And, and I always felt uncomfortable in the past few years, you know, talking about George Washington Carver or talking about, you know, any any person who is an American hero, in my eyes, George Washington Carver is, and, um, you know, he had a slavery in the past. And, you know, to talk about it like it's in the past is not the truth. And yeah. so I think our group of teachers really looking at that to say, okay, how are we going to do this in an age appropriate way? Kids want fairness. When they're yeah. four and five, they want that same size cookie. That's it. Like, and when they're seven, it is at the utmost, like developmentally, it is all concrete and fair and equal. And it is a beautiful time to start introducing this. And we can do it. It's developing um, a common language. That's another mm -hmm. thing we're looking at is developing definitions, making our work visible throughout the school. I Very hope that good. answers your question. It, it does. Very good. Um, I'm, we're going to go to Christian. Christian, can you answer the question as rela relates to what are you doing within your work and your practice to um, delve into this anti-racist work? Yes, thank you, Tasha. Um, I have the same kids from sixth grade to seventh and eighth grade. So there's a long process with me. And the first thing I do with students when they enter our school, or rather when they enter the middle school where I am, is I ask them to look around my classroom. And from the ceiling at last count, I really miss my classroom, by the way, yeah. there are 45 different flags hanging from the ceiling. And I'm talking full size, you know, I think they're three by four or something like that, flags hanging from the ceiling. And I always ask them, I say, look around, and you see the flag that represents where your family background identifies from. And, you know, after 45 flags, most years, you kind of have it covered. You think, like, they're going to. But then they come up to you, and some kids will come up to you later and say, well, my family's from the Virgin Islands, or my family's from Trinidad, or my family's from Ghana. And I always say to them, I say, like, ask your mom if you can bring in, like, two bucks, and we'll get that flag. They think the flag costs $2. They actually cost 7 But the point is, they take ownership of it after that. And they'll yeah. be like, Mr. Scott, the Caribbean Festival is this weekend. Can I have the Trinidad flag? So we take it down from the ceiling and they take the Trinidad flag with them. And it, it builds a sense of, we belong here. Because mm -hmm. no one flag is bigger than any other. And in fact, the only American flag I have is the 13 stars. But uh, mm -hmm. it's a room that the administrators, when they have people tour the building, they like to point to the room, like, look, look at all the flags. But that's, that's just the culture of the classroom. In terms of the curriculum, the challenge for me in I think a lot of teachers in uh, urban Massachusetts, urban New England, is most of our students uh, would identify as what island their family came from, whether you are Haitian, Dominican, Puerto Rican, or Jamaican. And there isn't a lot of curriculum that respects those identities, that highlights those identities. When, if you take any world history book, and there's some great ones out there that I love for a lot of reasons, but if you flip to the chapter on the Caribbean, or on people who were transplanted from Africa and enslaved in the Caribbean, it's, it's a footnote. And it's usually about what country brought them there and what industry they worked in there. It's not about the beautiful cultures that they have. It's not about the traditions that they bring from those islands. So I try and focus more on the culture of places rather than on the history, because history tends to be not always so inclusive and not always something that you want to put up there and highlight that the Spanish took this place or that the French put down this rebellion. So that's something that I do. I mean, some of the best conversations we have are when students who went to the DR, the Dominican Republic, over spring break come back and say, well, what did you do in the DR? And just letting that conversation happen. Now, in terms of, I guess, what we call like civil rights, which comes up in civics in eighth grade, um, the first few years that I taught, I worked with uh, Facing History, and I have nothing but love for Facing History. But 
the history that I was facing was the story of uh, white people oppressing black people in Arkansas in 1960. Mm. And my kids don't live in Arkansas in 1960, and they don't necessarily relate to black and white footage. They have been seeing Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech since they were in second grade, and they're kind of numb to that history. It's just, it's, it might as well be World War II to them. Mm. So what I've done, I worked with the Boston Public Library on this, was identifying uh, newspaper resources, so particularly the Boston Herald and the holdings at UMass Boston were very helpful on this, um, pulling up things that happened in the desegregation era, and not just in Charlestown, and not just in South Boston, where we typically focused, you know, it's, it's very easy for white populations in Massachusetts to say, well, you know, Southie, that's, that's Southie, that's what they do, you know, they throw rocks at buses. But when you see it happen in other neighborhoods, when you see it happen in your neighborhood, in your building, my school building is 100 years old. Uh, when it started, it was almost uniformly uh, white, Irish, or Italian. It was almost a Catholic school by itself. And then by the uh, late 70s, it was almost all African American. And then there was a push around the turn of the century, I guess we call it now, around 2000, to make it a pilot school called the Linden. So now the school, once again, it's almost kind of like one of those things like in Star Wars where the empire reforms in the background when you're not looking. Mm -hmm. The school now is approaching 65% white and you know, you have, to, you have to confront that history. The history is there in the walls and the building. You pop open these lockers that we have. And I love to do this at the end of the year, the beginning where we assign the lockers and you see the stickers that kids put up. Because, you know, there's, there's like old school Patriot stickers. But then you start to look at the stickers for the radio stations and the bands and the right. fashion. And you can see it. You can literally see the transition from one era to another. And just sometimes having conversations with the kids like, I remember that radio station, I remember that band, thinking of all the history that's happened in the building. Being aware of where you are, don't let civil rights history be in the past because it's happening in the present, and don't let it always be down in Dixie where we can, as New Englanders, you know, rise above. Uh, that's, that's, those are some of the approaches that I take. Thank you, Christian. I really appreciate that. It seems like, too, that you are uh, building relationships as you are, um, you know, unfurling culture. In that, we had a person ask um, about native language and home language. And I'm wondering when you are allowing students to represent who, where, who they are and where they're from, are you also allowing them to speak um, in their native language or their native tongue? And, and how does that link between um, who they are and the language they, they speak here in the United States and within the realm of um, the classroom? How does that work? Um, well, it, it's a fascinating topic, especially since our largest population are, uh, are Latinx students. And some will be speaking Spanish at home. Sometimes Spanish is the Sunday with grandma language. And they have varying degrees of confidence in how they speak Spanish. So the students who spend the whole summer back in the DR, they come back and they represent in Spanish and they will tell you things in Spanish and nothing tickles them more than when you learn a little Spanish and you kind of look at them when they're speaking Spanish, they're like, Oh, and so there's, there's that exchange. Um, there are other students where it's, it's almost like a smaller population. One of the more interesting things about where I live and teach in West Roxbury, Rosendale, is we have a large population of Albanian students uh, from Eastern Europe. And I always just thought they were fascinating to me because we're used to thinking of, you know, immigrants, immigrant groups in our schools as being people of color. These kids are, you know, as white as a Russian folk painting. Um, but they, they mostly were born in Albania and then settled in Greece as refugees and then came to the United States. Mm -hmm. And when those students, you know, get a chance to talk about Albania and to talk about their culture and to share their language, I think that's, it's something special because it allows them to acknowledge that, you know, I look like everybody else, but there's something more to me than right. I Right. Thank you for sharing that, Christian. Now, as we move over to you, Dan, you're also going to be answering the same question as it relates to, you know, what you have done in um, curriculum and what you what activities you use in regards to this anti-racist work. But one of the questions that came up is really how to use this in a science and math classroom. And so since you are a science teacher, can you really speak to that lens as it relates to how to integrate um, anti-racist work? I would love to, Tasha. Thank you. I 
Uh, and I think science is even more ripe for talking about anti-racist teaching than people think. I've heard some really thoughtful biology teachers talk about completely changing their genetics unit to talk about issues of race. I think that's phenomenal, but I think the curriculum can be suffused even more with anti-racist education. Um, so one of my favorite ways to encourage science teachers to make their science instruction more anti-racist is you can even be teaching the same units, but really focus on changing the context of the units. So you can provide relevant context when you ask your students to investigate, investigate phenomena in the science classroom, right? Like science inherently should be about solving problems and making sense of the phenomena and the world around you. Well, those phenomena should be contextualized in your community that you teach, what's relevant to your students and their lived experiences. So just to name a couple of examples, I have for a few years taught a unit on separating mixtures using chemical properties. Well, cool, you can show them a diagram of an oil spill. I did that for years. And then two years ago, I made the change after going to a phenomenal uh, Nova PD actually on environmental justice. And instead I started grounding that unit in the Flint water crisis and saying, let's talk about what's in the water in Flint. Let's talk about why it's not drinkable. Let's talk about the fact that depending on what you look like, you probably have very different access to clean water in this country. And it just made my students realize, that, oh my God, and some of them brought up, wait a minute, we can't use the water, the tap water in our school. And just seeing them make those connections and feel the relevance to their lived experience, it was just so powerful. And then to give another example that actually I just implemented this spring, uh, I taught my astronomy unit. Right? And I've always had the same question, like why, why are solar eclipses happening? And why, why are solar eclipses happening and why are they so rare? And then the small change I made this year is I showed an image of Christopher Columbus pointing at a solar eclipse while all of the Taino peoples are looking terrified because what Columbus has done is he would say, you know, my God is angry because you are not bringing me what I want. So I am going to blot out the sun. And we just had such a cool connection about imbalances of knowledge being imbalances of power and how like when we master knowledge, when we use our science skills to investigate the world, like we get to write some of those imbalances and like really challenge the power dynamics that are at so much of the root of weight, what makes for systemic racism in our country right now. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love how we have all integrated within our own classrooms to um, in different areas in different spaces that is comfortable for your teaching. And so with new teachers, right, what is comfortable with you within the framework that you can control the agency that you have, and then make that work there. So I think that that's good. And thank you all for sharing. TK. Yeah. Uh, and thank you again. I think if there's any through line that I've heard in a lot of your answers is the importance of cultural relevance and really understanding the audience and the context that you work with. And be it kindergarten or science, the importance of doing anti-racist work should be a through line in all of our teaching, right? Uh, and not just a random unit that we do in February just because it's Black History mm -hmm. Month. But also, just like how Dan said, an entire interrogation of power structures that exist in our school, right? Um, so from pedagogy to more abstract, we're going to talk a little bit about terms and languages. There were some questions about why do we use the term white educator versus black educator? Can't we just say educator, right? Uh, and by the way, those are incredible questions to ask. And I also encourage the folks who are in this right now to answer some of those questions instead of just waiting on the panelists also engage in them as well. But I did think it was a good starting off point to think a little bit about language and words. And, and I'm curious, you know, as a, as a person of color, um, what and how you have come to identify and define racism and white privilege in particular and how it's manifesting in, in, in our schools and, and with our students. Uh, and how have you grappled with these concepts of racism and white privilege and prompted your students to think about these, these heavy concepts? And so I'm not going to call on a specific person. We'll just do a popcorn style. But if anyone feels compelled to answer that question, the floor is yours. Um, I can start. Oh, sorry, Christian. <laughs> I always <laughs> jump in first, so I pause. I think I'm pausing, but it's really like a split second. <laughs> sorry, Christian. Um, so, um, yeah, I grew up in Florida like you, Christian. I grew up in Dade County um, in the 60s, a mm -hmm. uh, highly charged racial time there. Um, I also grew up in poverty, um, pretty, um, you know, traumatic poverty. So I didn't really like see any kind of privilege. I saw a lot of segregation and I thought we were all like losing. 
uh, uh, because of that, you know. Um, but as I um, grew up and had more control over my circumstances, um, I was able to identify um, my privilege, especially as a mom of two sons who are now like 28 and 24. And, you know, they could go to the store, they could ride their bike. And the only thing that I would ever have to say is like, you know, make sure you, you know, you stay on the block or make sure you buckle your helmet and all these, you know, worries that were real to me, but, um, you know, nothing compared to the talk that people of color have to give their sons particularly um, about the dangers that society has for them and their, and harming them, um, which is, you know, built into our system. And, and um, so like that became quite clear um, when I, when I had children. Um, but, you know, I began counting my blessings um, a, a while ago and, and um, w without thinking about white privilege. But as I look back, when I started to understand the term, I can see that, you know, um, even in poverty, <laughs> I still had privilege, you know, and I think that's really hard to grapple with for a lot of white folks who did grow up in poverty. Um, it's really hard for them to see um, that they were still, they still had privilege, you know, even though, you know, they pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, they had bootstraps, those bootstraps were given to them, you know, and so they're all already ahead of the game. Um, so um, I guess how I grapple with it, and then I'll just talk briefly about my students, how I grapple with it is, um, it, it's hard, I'm learning um, that we're all on a continuum, you know, and that, um, and like you said, um, Dr. Jones earlier, that, um, you know, we're all on a continuum, we're all learning, wherever you think you are on the continuum, it's forever, that way, because <laughs> it's a lifelong, um, you know, pursuit. Um, so, but, um, so I'm being patient, you know, I have always had knee jerk reactions and, you know, do this like big thing on Facebook. Are you kidding me? Oh, you know what? But, um, you know, I'm kind of done with the rejection and I'm trying to understand more and ask questions. Um, for my students, I think I, I um, brought that up a little bit that I have to do a better job to talk about white privilege and systemic racism. And it's hard, like I think I tried to protect them as little, little children, but all this protection, it's lying. You know, it's not telling the truth. And there are ways that we can do this in kindergarten. Thanks so much, Carrie. And I oftentimes think about being able to talk about race and identity is an active skill that all of our adults and especially our kids need to know. These are issues that they're gonna confront for the rest of their lives. And if we're not really giving them the language, the space in a structured academic setting to unpack these issues, then where do you think they're gonna find their talking points on race? probably dark corners of the internet, right? Um, thank you for that and also being vulnerable about how this development and journey is a lifelong pursuit. Uh, but Christian, I think you had an answer too, so I'm gonna throw it over your way. Yeah, and I, I'm just trying to sometimes answer live the questions that come up. Just real quick, somebody asked, where do I get the flags? Uh, Amazon, 599, Anley Flybreeze, shout out. Uh, so where I started with race, um, I'm a second generation teacher. My mother was a teacher in Daytona Beach where I grew up and Daytona is not the nicest part of Florida. If you've ever been to it, it's, it is what it is. But she taught from, as she liked to say, from Kennedy to Obama before she retired. And she taught the first uh, desegregated class in the county. And the thing about it was that my mom taught blind kids. So mm. that's why it was desegregated because in the words of her administrator, it doesn't matter to them. And I never could quite take the spin on that, whether that was inclusive or dismissive. I tend to think it was dismissive. And people often ask the question, it's teachers, you know, or they say, well, when did you have your first black teacher? And that's easy for me, because I can remember eighth grade science, uh, Miss Edwards. But I started turning the question, I was like, when did I have my first black classmate? And that was the one that I really, you know, I have those pictures that my mom saved, the class photos, and it took me, um, I looked through them, and when I was at Catholic school, no, nothing. And it wasn't until sixth grade when I was in a program that they used to call gifted and talented or enrichment, where they, you know, pull you out and tell you how smart you were and put you in a room and give you advanced work. And I was in that program, and it was just as white as my other classes. But then they decided to bus one African-American student in from across the county. 
and he and I became frenemies because we were both sort of outcasts in the class. And um, we worked together as the editors of the classroom paper and we clashed over everything. And I remember about halfway through the year, he told me he was not coming back after Christmas because he hated it. He hated the bus rides, he hated the kids, and he hated me and everything. And that was it. And I did not have black place classmates again until I did so poorly in math that I was put into general ed math. And that was the first time that I was in a classroom that was truly integrated. And this, I'm not that young and I'm not that old. That was the 80s and early 90s in Florida. So I think about that a lot. And, you know, I moved up here to New England after high school and I've lived in Boston since 94. For most of my time in Boston, I didn't work as a teacher. I worked as a chef. I went to culinary school in Rhode Island and then started working in hotels and kitchens. And it's not uncommon in that industry for everyone that you work with pretty much to be an immigrant from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that I think changed me a lot. It was going from one extreme to another. And then when I decided I would get into education as I you know, started to enter my late thirties, I honestly was nervous about it because I knew that Boston schools were predominantly students of color and that wasn't something that I had ever experienced. So before I committed to my teaching career and my path, I volunteered with 826 Boston to tutor in schools. And I tutored in schools around Boston for about six months, just so I could get a sense like, is this something, is this a role that I could see myself in? Or is this, you know, everything that I've seen on the scary TV shows and it's just not going to work? And I found like, okay, when I get in there and I talk, I'm awkward and they're awkward to see me, but you know, you, you, you be yourself in front of people and they, they start, you know, to feel that. And if they can trust you as a person that goes a long way. Now, the next phase of my life, I became a parent of three Boston public school students. And I do feel a little funny about it because I used my knowledge of the system as a teacher. I used my connections in the neighborhood, people who had older kids than mine, to figure out which kindergarten you wanna get your kid into, um, mm -hmm. to work on getting your kid test prepped so that they will get into one of the exam schools at a future date. And you know, we, we use that pathway, we use those connections, we use the, the money and the resources to get the tutoring to give our kids an advantage that many of my students, they simply don't have. And at my school in West Roxbury, I see that play out on a large scale. And to, to a person, none of these parents will ever sit down and say that to you that, I, well, I didn't want my kid to go to a predominantly black school, but somehow they never do, even though that's the district. So you have to kind of grapple with that and say, what does that say about me? And what does that say about the sixth grade parents who show up grade grubbing because they're worried if their kid gets a B, they won't make it into Boston Latin. So that's, that's part of where I'm at in my journey with that. Thanks so much, Christian. I also appreciate you for talking about the underrepresentation of uh, students of color in our advanced academic pathways. Uh, I'm an AP teacher in high school, and I noticed that we overrepresent white and Asian students, and we consistently underrepresent black and brown students, right? And that's a systemic issue that we all need to be interrogating. Likewise, how are we overrepresenting students in negative statistics? Who we discipline? Who gets suspended? right? Uh, and what does that say about the systems that we occupy? Um, so there's a lot of questions around, you know, white privilege um, and, and being white educators in a classroom uh, like your setting, Christian, or Dan, your setting, where you have many students who aren't uh, sharing your race. How have you navigated that? How has that shown up in your classroom? Dan? So first of all, I just want to name, there are some really great comments I'm seeing uh, just about like guilt about white privilege and about the fact that you may not identify with your students. I think one of my more recent revelations is I don't think guilt is very productive. And I think it, I'm not sure if you had a chance to either watch the video on Robin D'Angelo or if you've had a chance to read White Fragility. Like part of my privilege is how not often in my life I've had to reflect on the fact that I'm white. I'm able to move through the world and not be reminded of my race pretty often. And I think part of my privilege is that frequently when white people get guilty when they get upset, and this is Robin D'Angelo's core idea, they, they can shut down conversations. So I think something I've really tried to do is say, 
it's not about being guilty. It's about, okay, I'm, I have this new data, right? That, that my way of moving through the world is not how my students move through the world. And if I'm really going to act in allyship with my students and their families and the community, the question is not like, how can I, like, how can I feel bad? The question is like, what am I gonna do about it? What's the internal work? What can I be learning? And then what's the external work? I saw a great question someone put up about like not putting burdens on teachers of color. That is a great question. Like one thing we can do, I know Christian talked about like how excited students are to like engage with you in Spanish. Like I know something I've, that's only come to my realization like a couple of years ago is like, I don't need to run off and ask people to translate for me. I can try to find translation resources. I can even try slowly, slowly, but surely to improve my Spanish because the more we put those invisible taxes on teachers of color, the more we add to a system that causes teachers of color, especially in urban settings, to leave the classroom faster because they're paying that invisible tax. So again, I, I would say focusing on the guilt is less productive than like, I have more data, so what am I going to do with that to make for a more equitable system? Yeah. Thank you, Dan, in regards to that. I really think that's necessary for us to use uh, what, what we know and, and how we can um, use uh, things internally to help with the external process, right? And I think that's necessary. It also lends me back to this, this place of grappling with um, how we are looking at our stakeholders and who our stakeholders are, you know, just like almost defining who who do we answer to? And I think that's the question that I want to ask, right? I want to ask that question as it relates to who, who are your stakeholders and who do you consider? Define that for me, right? Define what you consider or who you consider your stakeholders and what do you owe them in that context, right? And so if that can be, you know, elaborated upon, that would be great. And and don't neglect the, the thought process of, um, how to ensure the connectivity or the cohesion between um, more than one, if there's more than one stakeholder, right? So if there's more than one person that you have to answer to, how then is that, that relationship cohesive and making sure that the anti-racist work is necessary? You got it? Do I, do I need to, we got it, okay, good. Okay, so anybody can jump in, right? Um, and go from there. So I can cold call. Okay, I paused. <laughs> I paused. Okay. Before I put, it, put that down in, on the record. I did pause. <laughs> um, so uh, I feel, uh, first of all, I feel really lucky um, that um, I have a group of colleagues in my school um, th that we were able to start a, a professional uh, learning uh, community that we are going into our third year now, that we have uh, difficult conversations together, that we trust each other, that we have been building um, you know, our own coalition in order to go out to the other stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we're slowly doing that. Um, and we have, um, you know, that's sort of like the, how we are communicating. We are, you know, sending communications to parents through the school newsletter um, and through, we're developing a website that we're sharing with some of the participants. It's a work in progress. Um, but, um, and the, the lessons too. Um, our uh, curriculum director in our town is uh, very uh, proactive with this work. And I would say actually our school principal is too. Now, after the murder of George Floyd, everybody came out with anti-racist statements. Our town manager, the police department, you know, um, the school committee, the superintendent, the administrators, we are developing our own mission statement and action plan to move forward um, and did this work over the summer because of the urgency, but it's, you know, we're late to the urgent party. I'm late to the urgent party. Um, what, I, what I think will come of this is that there's a lot of stakeholders here. There's mm -hmm. families there, yes, the police department, yes, the library, yes, the town manager. So they have all put out these anti-racist statements and good, that's a great start, but that's a piece of paper. So now where's the action behind these statements? So mm -hmm. we're developing our actions behind our statements. 
And what I'd like to see is uh, that we're able to reach out in a collaborative spirit to um, have, a, a, I guess, multi entrances to this topic because it can't all come from teachers and it can't all come from parents and it definitely can't come from just people of color. You know, uh, Dan, you said that so wisely that you haven't had to grapple with your race because you just are able to just go through, you know, life without thinking about it. So, um, so I think that's what you were talking about, Dr. Jones, about stakeholders. So I feel like we need to hold people more accountable. One more thing is that we have a group of, uh, a large group, growing group of families in our, our small town who are very interested in this work. Our group has reported out to them. They have, you know, um, engaged with us. Um, so, um, you know, there is a movement mm -hmm. and not just in our town, there is a movement and it's not going to end. You know, yeah. it's not gonna be like you said, Dan, we had the privilege of going, well, that's terrible. You know, now I'm going bowling or whatever, you know, um, so. That's how we're trying to get our stakeholders involved by holding everybody accountable for what they have already said. Thank you, Carrie. I love that too, that you have committed to saying that it's more than one stakeholder. It's not just us in the school, it's not just the teachers, it's not just the administrators, but we're gonna call on parents, we're gonna call on the community and everyone else. And I think the one thing that we have to make sure that we keep to the forefront of our minds is that for people of color, blacks, Latinos, or whoever else, this is not a new phenomenon for them right? Like this is this work they have been doing their life in, inherently and or, you know, uh, implicitly, right? Like they have had to deal with some type of um, racism. They've had to deal with um, injustices on multiple levels in multiple places and multiple arenas. And so although some people might be new to this work, the people that we serve in education are not, right? those those students are not and so can we look at what who are the stakeholders and and, and what do we owe them uh, it looks like you're ready to jump in there dan so i'm gonna let you go ahead yeah i was just excited you were talking about families in the community but it, i think a just one thing i'd add to that tasha is i think there's a difference from approaching it with the lens of i am going to serve my community versus i'm going to partner with my community and I think sometimes the dialogue can be more one-sided than it should be if you're going to have meaningful anti-racist education. I think TK put it really well in the introduction, like our communities we serve, every community we serve has assets, right? Our parents bring assets, our grandparents bring assets, like the cousins and aunts and uncles. And like thinking not just about how am I serving my students, and I need to serve my students and my families, obviously, but I also need to listen I also need to make the school an inviting place. I need to provide opportunities throughout the day because maybe there are different working hours. I need to get out in the community. Um, really partnering with our families and partnering with the community is what's going to serve our students and our families in that like, most profound way. And I just think like, that needs to be a two-way street. But the other thing I just want to name about stakeholders on an unrelated comment is like everyone on this call, in my opinion, is someone who's in partnership with me. Like this work, I, and I, I wanna use I statements, this work is scary to me as a white person because like I said, I have skated through most of my life not grappling with this. And it takes, like, it takes those accountability groups, like Carrie said, right? You're not going to, to find those people who can encourage you and say, this is what the work looks like and I'm not gonna let you forget about it next month because that's not the kind of country and society we wanna build. Right. I, I thank you for that in regards to the language, in regards to partnership and service, right? And looking at that from that standpoint. And so if you're looking at the stakeholders being the parents and or the students who actually show up in the building, right? So if there were no parents sending the students into the building or sending them to remote classes, you wouldn't be um, you know, positioned in your position anyway, right? Because you would have no one to service. But if you look at them as partners, if you look at the parent as the partner and say, this is my business partner and that our stock is going into the service of the children, right? Or what we're doing for the child, then we, we might have this a, a different outlook and look at it from a different lens. And so thank you for bringing up the language component in regards to that. Christian, can you please let 
uh, us all know in regards to stakeholders. How do you define the stakeholders and what do you owe? I just noticed uh, someone asked a question about my district about BPS and white privilege in the exam schools and the new superintendent. So I just kind of wanted to take a, a little run at that because that is something that impacts my school drastically. We lose literally 50% of our sixth grade goes off to exam school and 50% remains and you can guess how that breaks down along mm -hmm. with backgrounds. Um, it was just last year that Boston Public Schools for the first time let the kids take the test in school. Up until that time, they did it on a Saturday at one of four buildings around the district. So that meant that you had to have a parent who had Saturday morning free and a car or some means to get you there and have you in that seat. Why this wasn't done in the classroom like the MCAS, I don't know. You know, you can, you can draw your own conclusions on that. Um, the actual publishers of the ISEE test, which is, I believe it's the independent school exam entrance, um, asked the BPS to stop using this test because they didn't consider it appropriate. So we have been scrambling to find a new test. And you can imagine if you're one of these parents, the privileged parents who had your kid on a glide path to get into the school, and you no longer know what test they're gonna take, they're like pulling their hair out. So it's, it's fascinating how that system moves but to talk about stakeholders and parents if you teach at the secondary level especially in my building as a k-8 to so we have them from you know four all the way to 14 the parents stop showing up in middle school they're just they're all over you in the lower grades and they're you know they're doing bake sales and they're showing up and it's great and then by the time it's middle school they check out and particularly you do not see parents from our, our Latinx community coming into the school. And there, there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of it having to do with jobs, some of it having to do with language, some of it having to do with commute. But you, the stakeholders that are well represented and have shouting parents, I'm happy for them. And that's, that's what every kid deserves. But you sometimes have to become the advocate for your students of color because their parents aren't showing up to site council. They aren't making these decisions. They aren't badgering the administrators in the district in the same way to get the access. So you as their educator have to work with them as students to help develop where they're going to go when they leave eighth grade. That's something I spend a lot of my lunch hours doing is helping kids write applications, writing reference letters, helping them explore their high school choices. And sometimes I even go against my district and say, maybe you should look at this school. Maybe you should consider this program out of the district so that they get the best opportunity for themselves, wherever that might be. Uh, another thing that I do to try and bring these kids different opportunities is I work with outside partners. The beautiful thing about teaching in Boston Public Schools is most partnerships, most universities are dying to work with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I take full advantage of that. I work with Youth Enrichment Services. And for three years, we've had a cross-country ski team at my school. We're the only school in Boston that does that. The kids pay $20 and then we have six lessons and a race at a ski track. Um, so that's something that we've done. I work with Generation Citizen to do civics actions projects. And we've been doing that for the past seven years. Um, and just looking for partnerships that you can find like that with universities and other things that can help broaden these, these students' view of where they can go next and who they are and what they're capable of. You know, a lot of my students had never been skiing before and maybe it just seems like fun but it broadens their sense of things. You know, I love that moment when we're on the bus and this is the first time some of them have ever seen mountains with snow on it. And you, you, you change something in that kid or the partnership with Discovering Justice where we, we go to the federal court system and we meet lawyers and we try cases and we learn how the court system works. Those, those are powerful moments. That's, that's changing the way they look at things in the world. And that's the beauty of teaching in a city. There are a million partnerships. There are a million places to go. If you um, overcome your administrator's fear of taking the kids out of the building, there's a lot out there that, that can empower young people and broaden their horizons. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think I hear this. Um, uh, first of all, let me thank you for sharing what is going on in your district as it relates to parents. And I, I, I think that 
uh, in some districts that is not necessarily the truth. I know that I am in Springfield, Massachusetts, and in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the middle school, our parents are the most active, and they are the most active. They show up to donuts with dad and uh, muffins with mom, and they show up to see their their children's um, data on the walls along with their pictures. And so I think our parents are the most um, engaged, partly because. The, the school has created opportunities for them to be engaged, something to be engaged with, right? And so I, I thank you for, for sharing that because it's different all across the country. It's different all across the state, right? And so being able to, to add to that lens, but I also wanna say that as, as quickly as you were able to um, learn that as soon as you engage our children with something that they haven't experienced or something new, it expands their, their thought process and you are able to visually see that. That same concept is used with the anti-racist work. People did not just show up in regards to slavery. There were people who were civilized and living in actual kingdoms and doing actual learning before slavery happened. And so teaching from that lens of going beyond what they already know can also open up that mind and you can visually see a change or an altered state in a student because you are exposing them to something new that they haven't seen yet, right? And that happens with culture, that happens with race, it happens with um, a, a plethora of things. As in fact, the standard, uh, the Sanford, Stanford summary says that teaching um, race cultures or teaching cultures outside of uh, uh, the United States or outside of American cultures has increased um, grades by 21%. And so we would look at the data, all people um, greatly, um, they are greatly valued or they are enhanced. It becomes asset learning when they, when they move past just what is in our history books or what is that what what we have seen or deemed necessary at this point um, in regards to what belongs in the classroom and what doesn't. So thank you, all three of you for sharing that lens in regards to who are the stakeholders and if the children are the stakeholders, what do you owe them? And if you look at it through the lens as your administrator is the stakeholder, what are you then going to try to prove to your administrator to 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 make sure that this was this work is equitable? Okay. Oh, um, so speaking of stakeholders, and I appreciate how all of you have mentioned positive stakeholders, um, but I think the reality in a lot of the questions that we've been getting uh, are around stakeholders, be they our colleagues, be they uh, the parents of the students that we teach or school leaders who might be hesitant when it comes to discussing anti-bias, anti-racist work, who might reject uh, that this kind of work is inherently political and therefore doesn't have a space in the classroom. Uh, I want to be mindful of time, right? Uh, but I just did want to open up that question to anyone. How do you respond to that kind of hesitation? Um, it, it, it's really difficult. Um, and I guess um, sometimes when we've, um, or I, well, I'll speak for myself, but our, our group is trying to grapple with that too. Um, you know, we've had a, a few presentations that, um, you know, made, um, uh, made for difficult conversations to get messy and personal and um, you know it, it's a as I said before we have not only not been taught how to talk about it we were taught not to talk about it so mm -hmm. um, I think if we can preface things um, we, we were talking about this the other day in our group like you know having sentence starters you know, like having protocols, and I can't believe I'm saying that. My curriculum director's gonna be so happy I just said protocols, but um, having, <laughs> having protocols um, and, you know, structures that help us um, talk about it in, in, you know, civil ways, um, because you want to think of, of best intentions. But, you know, there is knee-jerk reaction. Um, Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility book, uh, to me, I know it's being like, you know, in the realm of being criticized a lot, but to me, it explains so much about like people feeling offended, but, you know, and, and uh, about being a racist. And to me now, I'm not trying to change the mind of somebody who uh, has racist thoughts with any, I, I'm focusing on systems, you know? 
you can like come along and that's great if it all works out, but we have systems to change. And hopefully when those systems change, they might shed some light, open some windows, enlighten people to feel a little less afraid of the reality, you know, of, of white privilege. Um, it's tough. I think everything has to be prefaced with, this is gonna be difficult, this is gonna be messy, we all don't have answers, but let's, let's see if we can talk. But protocols, sentence starters, I think will be helpful. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. I just wanna build off that very last thing Carrie said, when she says it's going to be messy, this will be challenging, there's a lot of value in establishing norms for these spaces. And I think really thoughtful ones, things like, ask questions, make I statements. And I think my personal favorite one is just like, be vulnerable and open to change. I think I said it before, guilt is not productive, vulnerability is. And to go back to the second question we talked about tonight, like what does racism and white privilege means, right? Racism is something that I feel like has been co-opted, that someone is racist, mm -hmm. uh, right? The KKK is racist. Like, yes, that's obvious. But there are great images you can find online of icebergs, where the vast majority of things that perpetuate systemic racism are not what we would think of as explicit racism. And they perpetuate a lot of the systems Carrie is talking about. So having thoughtful norms that let you interrogate and excavate things like that can be really productive. A second thing I would just say is, Part of my privilege is sometimes I give up on the conversation before I should. And I just want to name that. There are moments, like I know it's really easy to joke about the Thanksgiving table and political arguments, but I didn't really start having challenging conversations with my family even until this spring. And I will be honest, they were hard and they were long and there was a lot of, a lot of feelings. And it's just about like keep going until you find those common values and like common things that you can get on the same page about. I mean, I've had people who are really interested in real estate where the common ground was learning about the history of redlining or people with military history who were fascinated to hear that the GI Bill did not apply to black veterans, right? Just keep working at it until you can find that common ground and have those breakthroughs because our students depend on it, especially when we put the really necessary all in front of students. So those are just the two things I'd add. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, Christian, fine, we'll go to you. Uh, and then after this, we're gonna go into our after show dialogue. For those of you who do have to leave because it is eight o'clock, I wanna be mindful of your time and say thank you so much for staying with us. But we are gonna be hanging out for a little bit to continue on this discussion. And so please feel free to continue on asking your questions, sending some love to the panelists. Uh, that being said, Christian, back to you. Uh, one, of, one of the systems that we have in place in my school, and it's, it's kind of, they're seeding it throughout the district in Boston and maybe other districts are using it as well, is called uh, restorative justice or short name for it would be RJ. And I remember when I had to do the training for it, it was literally two days with me and other teachers and they had set up this mandala rug and they had the bells and the essential oils being diffused. And I was, you know, I'm very cynical. I'm like, just talk to me real. Don't make me hold a rock to talk. So I initially was dismissive of this program and there was the, the woman who kept coming to our school, are you using RJ and social studies? I'm like, we already have a real dialogue in here. We don't, we don't necessarily need that. And then there was an incident with two of my, uh, three of my sixth grade boys, where one boy whose family is, um, background is from India, was telling another boy about a girl on YouTube, uh, an actress that he had a crush on. And it was, you know, that kind of awkward sixth grade talk. And the boy he was speaking to was white, replied to him, he says, there's no way she's ever going to date an 11-year-old Indian boy. And the boy whose family is from India threw him through the bathroom door. <laughs> and he was on the floor and the substitute freaked out and called me over. And I had to kind of untangle why the kids are mad at the kid who's on the floor crying. And that was like the first real circle that I did in my room because I was the teacher who dealt with the incident and just letting those kids talk about it. And the fact that it was a, a white student and a student from India talking about it created a kind of opening for kids of other backgrounds to speak out about it as well, because it didn't start out in that kind of very awkward, let's talk about white people and black right. people and that a lot of right. students just dump on you and expect all these African-American students to represent everything about African-American history that they probably haven't been taught anyways. 
So it, it just kind of opened up the conversation of what things have you seen? What things are you feeling? And the beautiful thing about RJ is I'm like, right now, I'm not doing all the talking. I'm doing very little talking and the students are doing the talking and they also have the ability to pass because it's important for your students, especially those who represent smaller groups in your school. Like I had a student who wore hijab and I didn't ever want her to feel that she had to represent that or explain that. Maybe if she wants to, that's great, but you don't want to put them on the spot so they can pass. They don't have to share and then they can share when they want to. I highly recommend, even though I reluctantly embrace it, restorative justice practices as, a, as an alternative to just taking everyone to the principal's office and yeah. Well, thank you for bringing it back to discipline and other systemic issues that exist out there. Um, one thing that I kind of grapple as the teacher of the year is, is that precise question of like, these are politicized questions. And it always makes me think of how weird that is, given how everything that we do as teachers, you know, are inherently political, be it from like funding, how large our class sizes are, you know, who gets compensated or not, and in what terms. Then why is it that when it comes to race discussions, it becomes the political topic that we can't touch? Right. right. Um, that's something always that I that I think about and and be it Dan, your norms, uh, carry your sentence starters, uh, Christian, your restorative justice approaches. I'm hearing like we're not just going into these classrooms and saying, hey, we're going to talk about race because I want to and I'm going to go on my soapbox and make a political rally. Right. speech. It's about our ability to connect these topics to the skills that we're working on. Right. Um, writing literacy related content, um, whatever your grade is, we're I think for me, my ability to connect the things that we're discussing in terms of our learning, right, um, is, is always one way of sort of offsetting those concerns that I'm just talking about political issues, which I'm not, right? Um, last I question. Also, oh, yeah, go ahead, Masha. Uh, I also feel like, too, that we have to keep in mind that um, when you're thinking in that, that way, it's, it's kind of, um, not kind of, but it is, telling our students inadvertently that they don't matter, right? Like when you're thinking in the aspect that the only thing that I can teach you is a Eurocentric um, way to learn, understand, and culture, those are the only authors that you read, those are the only, you know, lifestyles that you understand are only cultures that you read about that it, it, it becomes a very monolithic way of doing things and that's not who we are and that's not who is represented in our classrooms and so sometimes just not sometimes all the time it's okay to teach the truth all the time it is okay to teach the truth <laughs> like that's not a bad thing <laughs> yeah and and unfortunately our truth has been whitewashed our truth has been very linear and yeah. when we're not exposed to different perspectives, our cultural imagination and our ability to come up with solutions to our most pressing global problems are also inherently limited as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so why don't we like, move forward in terms of thinking about what life looks like in the fall, you know, be it hybrid, be it remote, be it physical. There's a lot of anxiety going on, right? Uh, and so I just want to ask you guys, what are our action steps moving forward? Um, how will you take uh, what we're learning uh, where you're sort of processing a lot of these topics, both in and outside of the classroom, to continue on making a difference. I can cold call. Oh, <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll, I'm so just. We'll, we'll start with you, again. <laughs> um, I um, you know, the, uh, oof. who knows if we're coming back? Um, our big plan require you know one of the um, major focuses are is to get our classroom libraries audited you know to take an inventory there's a great app called book source that you just can click on the isbn number and it um you know generates a list so we had volunteers we had some parent volunteers we had high school um kids doing community work so it was like really comprehensive and was very exciting and then you know march 12th we all went home <laughs> but um so hopefully that is something that can continue if we can get in the buildings. Um, but the, the big uh, equity issue, I guess, really, if we're doing remote is uh, providing hotspots um, for kids and making sure that people have the technology across the board to be able to attend. Um, you know, in March, we were all like willy nilly, like, okay, if you show up, it's good. If not, you know, and we didn't really get great direction. And I think now if we do go remote, there's gonna be a lot more accountability and we're gonna to have to 
understand what that means in different households. Um, and uh, at the bare minimum, we're getting people what they need um, besides food and those other things that schools do, but um, you know, the technology and the hotspots. Um, the so social work and the, um, you know, this work has to be integrated and kids are anxious. All of this unsaid stuff that we, you know, that we don't talk about, they make up their own stories and they're usually worse. You know, if they, you know, like you said, Christian, you know, that the kids are, were talking and that's what they need to do. They need to talk about George Floyd. Yeah. They need to talk about the protests. So. Thank you, Carrie. So continue on somehow, I guess is my <laughs> general gist of it. Christian. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, uh, you know, we were in remote learning and, uh, everybody got very familiar with Zoom, including the kids. And it was a kind of funny thing. I got a Zoom invite from a sixth grade boy. I was like, what's he want to talk about, you know? I figured it was something about school. And uh, then he's like, this is my Black Lives Matter Zoom. And it was the day after the largest protests in Boston. And the odd thing was, uh, you know, he was a, a young man of color. He it felt to me once he, I saw who he invited to the Zoom, what, which peers he invited, he did not want to get on there and like, you know, beat the drum. He wanted to check in with his white friends to see where they were at because he felt very nervous about things because of what he'd seen on TV with the police in Boston. And during that same period, I volunteered to be the guy who distributed the Chromebooks for my school. So I drove around in my Honda with a bunch of, you know, Chromebooks in the back. And I've lived here in Rosendale for 15 years. And I found streets and places that I had never been to before, mm -hmm. where these kids were living, where you would go and, you know, there, half the doorbells were busted out. And then you'd get into the house and you'd find out that they were subletting a space inside of a space, or maybe they weren't there, they had moved on. And those challenges, you know, this, this shutdown really laid that bear for us and you know how do we move forward with that if we continue with remote learning how do we provide the services that our students need one thing we're doing at our school because desi came down on boston public schools for our inequities is in our building they identified an underperforming subgroup which is a fancy way of them saying that the um, african-american students score significantly lower than their their white peers and they said, you know, how are you going to work on it? What are you going to do about that? And one of the things that we uncovered in, in talking about that as a staff team is that there are two types of special ed in the world of public schools. And this is something that hardly ever gets to the surface is there are IEPs for parents who want their kid to have accommodations and who advocate for it and who bring a lawyer and they get those accommodations. And those are people with privilege. And then there are the IEPs that are given to the students without privilege because that student's need was so glaring that you could no longer ignore it in a regular classroom setting. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of money and a lot of resources on special education, but there are a lot of kids who receive extensive services who will be okay. And then there are a lot of kids who don't get any services because they never had that advocate. So how we evaluate students and how we provide services for them needs to change because we're tending to underserve students who need it the most because we don't see them until they're setting the desk on fire because they don't have that parent who's going to come in and demand that service but the need is there so that's that's a challenge for me yeah. i think one of the questions that i wanted to have answered through this whole process too is how do we continue to push forward with um the 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 what we have, especially like in regards to literature, in regards to what what is in the canon, what should be introduced to the canon, um, what what ways do we um, and what ways do, do do we expand how and what we teach? Right, like um, I'm not. I don't think that any of us are asking to anybody to commit to this anti-racist work and throw away everything that you've done so far 
right? So how do you integrate and, and being honest and truthful in regards to what still needs to be taught, right? Like what books still need to be taught, what lessons still needs to be taught, what skills need to be taught, and then how do we integrate and make sure embed um, additional work to help uh, widen the lens of what our students are seeing, and then how do we do that through remote learning too? And I think that came up a couple of times in the in the chat and people want to know that like um where do, where do we start with this anti-racist work like where do we start go ahead dan well i think there are a couple pieces to what you're saying tasha on the one hand i i already spoke about and i totally agree with you we're not talking about throwing out the curriculum i think there are pieces of it that should be critically examined for sure but i think there's also just a lens you apply to it Right, I spoke before about, can you teach the same labs? Can you teach the same units? And just think about a lens that is relevant to your students' lived experience, relevant to what they see in the world. The other thing, and forgive me, I don't remember who said it before, but it's not just what we teach by, but also how we teach it, right? Yeah. Am I talking at students? Am I, as a white male of privilege, just like sitting into that banking model where if I talk at you enough and if you absorb everything, you will be successful? Because no, right? That's not going to work. That's not going to empower my students. So I know that Carrie talk, talked a little bit about what happens if we're virtual. I think there are ways even virtually for us to live out things like giving students choice, letting things be self-paced, letting things be differentiated, allowing for discussion, allowing for meaningful scaffolds. One of my favorite tools, for example, and TK will laugh somewhere because he knows I love talking about this, is Flipgrid because Flipgrid really amplifies student voice in a cool way. And my students even asynchronously, asynchronously can respond to each other. I don't wanna steal TK's thunder, but I know he loves Jamboard, right? What are these tools we can build in to allow for meaningful collaboration with our students? And then Tasha, to your point, there's just so much ongoing learning that needs to happen, right? Find those people who you know are on your team to start, hold yourselves accountable to the ongoing learning and reflection and then to the earlier thing we were talking about, just really keep dedicating yourself to that work of learning, reflection, looking for opportunities to make a productive change. I, I think that's the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I think the word process is a wonderful way to end this because one thing that Tasha and I wanted to make clear is that this is an ongoing process. It's not a fad, anti-racist, anti-bias work. It's not a one and done thing. And just like how racism and white supremacy are parts of the, the smog that we breathe, right? It's important for us to have the necessary hygiene and the daily work to combat that, right? Um, thank you so much. It is 8.17. I want to be really mindful of everyone's time and just call out the fact that we have over 350 people still here wanting to be part of this wow. conversation. So I think it says a lot about our incredible educators. I'm going to copy and paste the link for our feedback survey for today as well, because this webinar thing is the first of its kind, and we did not anticipate this many folks to be here, but we are also super grateful and would love to know what your feedback is. Uh, so thank you again uh, so much for today. Uh, Carolyn, I'm going to have you have the last word and close us out. Okay. All right. I think it's obvious uh, from what happened and all of the comments that you see in the chat boxes that um, you all are um, just what the doctor ordered, if I can be so trite. Um, Christian, Dan, and Carrie uh, have all worked with us as educator ambassadors. Dan is a current educator ambassador. Christian and Carrie have both been long time associates of WGBH education, helping us to um, stay authentic to what teachers need. And to Karu and Tasha, our new friends of public media, and I hope um, I hope we uh, continue to and eventually go steady. I hope that that's the way it works out. So thank you, thank you to everyone. And Angelica and April in the Q and A box, uh, thank you. So um, a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, we will send out a follow up email to everyone who registered with the recording link, as well as the link to the resource document, which is um, ever changing. The resource document is now populated with many ideas of what to read, watch, and listen to from previous anti-racism sessions that we have hosted. And then we will be adding to it from the um, current 
panelists and facilitators. So that's a living and breathing document. Um, again, August 11th is the next peer exchange. This is not one and done for public media at all. Public me uh, media stations across the country, as well as PBS, our mothership, the association that all PBS stations belong to, is committed to this kind of work. And we're making very concrete changes. So thank you to everyone. Um, I do wish you um, some R&R &R this summer. Um, it's certainly a testament to teachers and how hard you work that we have been running many summer events and they're always um, attended by hundreds of Massachusetts ed educators. So thank you. Um, and we're going to close out. We'll, um, oh, one other thing that we saw this question come up a lot. We will not make available to you the whole uh, Q&A um, transcript because of the identifying information um, and the same with the chat. But we will pull out the gems, add it to our resource document, do some synthesizing of information. And you have my email if you have any specific questions or comments. So. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the summer break. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.